Jesus. All right, good morning. Welcome to Royal City Community good Church. Morning. We're going to ask everybody to rise, stand on your feet as we enter into this time of worship. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. We love you all. We appreciate you. We're going to get started. I'm going to read a declaration. It's from our book that we've been doing at Growth Group. It's called The Prophetic Warrior. So I want you all to remember you are a warrior. It says, today is not business as usual in the body of Christ. It is not same old, same old. The power of God will be seen like never before. We only have a toe in the water of what God is about to do in us, through us, and for us. Truly, we have not been this way before. Everything will look different. Leaders, structures, education systems, financial systems, church buildings, and how we operate. God has hit the reset button. It is foolishness to expect the old things to remain, to think that the old things will work. I am not prophesying that one day you will walk in the new. You are in the new right now. It is time to break agreement with smallness and the shrunken ways that you have thought in the past. It is time to break with repetitive thinking, for God is releasing a new mindset to you. Accept that, church. Accept that. You will receive new thoughts, new plans, new ideas, new creativity, and fresh anointings. And you will have prophecy that flows from you. You will be living in the river of revelation, not dipping in and out, not warming yourself up. You will lose your fear of being a bold truth teller. You will break out of the fear of your own voice and you will break out of the fear of failure. The stifling of the prophetic will be no more and you will prophesy like never before, receiving revelatory upgrades, words of knowledge and power that bring life come forth. Your voice will command the impossible to pass. Your mouth will become a house of creation. There is a new anointing to create what has not been seen before. This is the time when you will be going beyond where you have been before. You will be go you will go beyond your last war and victory, your last level of strength, your last level of glory, your last business deal, your last level of working miracles, signs and wonders. You will go beyond where the church has been. You will go beyond even your wildest expectations and dreams. It is time to step over and step into the days of going beyond. For this is the epoch where the prophetic warriors will arise and God's words will rest in their mouths and they will cry and they will call into order what is in disarray. It is time for the sick to stand in front of you, afflicted by their demons, pain, unforgiveness, and generational curses, and for you to know who you are. It is time for the demonic to know your name and to take note when you arrive on the scene because you have not blinked in the face of their schemes and you know who you are. It is time for a mind transformation so that your thinking is brilliant and shining, full of glory. It is time for a new level. It is time for you to know who you are and to know whose you are. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus, for the new things you are doing in this house this morning, Father God. And as we've been declaring, Father God, we know you are going to blow our minds. You are going to do so much more than we can even expect, Father God. And we thank you as we enter into this time of worship and the message, Father God, that you are just restoring our hearts and our minds, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. You are bringing what we are waiting for to pass, Father God, for your promises are yes and amen, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. We, bring, we speak joy into this house, into every heart, Father God. And as we go into worship, Father God, I just pray, I pray a new, fresh anointing to fall. Amen. Let's put our hands together this morning. We welcome you this morning. This is a good day to celebrate our Lord. This is a good day to rejoice and give thanks. This morning, we're going to celebrate. We're going to tell the devil that God has a final say. And we're going to Hands together. Who has the final say? Jehovah has the 
for me. It says here that God is on our side, church. He has overcome. Yes, He has overcome. That means you guys are overcomers. And we will not be shaken. We will not be moved. Jesus is here this morning. Let's praise Him right now. Thank you, Jesus.
that we are not shaken and we are not moved when we face trials, Jesus. Because we know that when we speak your name, you come and you bring heaven's armies with you to fight with us and to fight for us. Thank you, Jesus. You are a mighty deliverer. You are triumph and you are truth, Father God. We will wait upon you, Father God. We will stand firm in our battles for you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Chains be broken right now. Lives be healed, Jesus. Eyes be open, Father God, this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
stands for something. His name stands for promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, All the promises of God are answered, yes, in Christ Jesus. Know that the promises of God are yours. They are mine. In the name of Jesus. Look to Jesus. Speak the name. And you will find the healing needed for those things that upset you, discourage you, distress you. For his name is above every name. When you feel totally lost, just speak the name of Jesus. I pray you realize there is more that Jesus has. So much more for you. I pray God speaks to you and touches you in a new and powerful way. Changing your life forever. Thank you, Jesus. Give us new words. Give us new visions. Exceedingly above what we can even imagine, Father God. So much more, Jesus. You have so much more for us, Father. I pray that our hearts are crying out for more of you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. We speak your name over every situation and circumstance. We speak your name into it right now, Jesus. Thank you, Father God, right now, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah.
speak yes, your name. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Have when we name. speak your name, God, thank mountains you, have to Hallelujah. move, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Speak the name. I was telling Ross this morning. I said I got to church early this morning and I started praying over the sanctuary because my goodness was the enemy trying it this week with me. <laughs> I went into the bathroom at work on Thursday and I cried. And I told my coworkers, I said, I don't understand what is going on. I said, I've never experienced this level of disrespect from parents. And I said, I understand. But why? Why? And my, my co-worker is a Christian. She said, because there is an enemy attacking. She said, the devil is trying to get to you. He is using whoever he can. So I went in my office and I shut the door. And I put my Christian music on. And I started speaking God's name over every child in my center. Every parent. Every family. I spoke his name into the building. So that the enemy has to flee. I said, no more. No more. I don't care what the enemy brings. It is not coming into this space. And it's not that everything got perfect after that. But I got stronger. I didn't let it bother me anymore. I said, no. Nope. I'm putting a smile on my face. And I'm going to look at these parents. And I'm going to love them. Because maybe they're just going through a really hard time. I don't know. But I said, I'm going to love them. And I'm going to be that example of Christ to them. But we need to start speaking God's name over everything, over ourselves. Because the enemy is trying. He's trying to steal your peace and your joy. And when he can get in your mind, he's won. So we need to start speaking Jesus' name and saying, no more. Satan, you must flee when I enter the room because I have my authority from God and I am walking in victory. So see, you have nothing. You need to fear me when I walk in the room, Satan. You need to flee when I walk into the room. No more. We're not accepting anymore. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given us all authority. You have given us all victory. We walk in your boldness, Jesus. We're not afraid to tell the enemy to get out. Thank you, Jesus, of all situations, whether it's health, financial, family, Satan, get out. Thank you, Jesus. Any devices that he has, we scramble it. We send his arrows right back into his camp. Yes, in Jesus' name, thank you, Father God. Let's give the Lord a hand. Clap for that declaring words, Patricia. Amen. This is a season where they're going to start speaking things into being. This is a season where they're going to start declaring and proclaiming the word. You have no other weapon. You have no other weapon but the word and the praise that comes out of your mouth. I want you guys to stand. Some of you are seated. For those of you who can't stand. As what Trisha was saying, this, can you put up those words, um, Diane? Come believe it, come receive it. From the last song that Trisha sung. This is a declaring word. Come, believe it. Come on, church. We came to believe that God is going to do something this morning. We come believe. We come expecting him to do something. If you only came to watch and see what we're doing, you're going to be disappointed. But I'm telling you this morning, if you came expecting God to do something through you, for you, you're going to receive it this morning. I don't know what you're standing in faith for. I don't know what you're believing God for, but it says come and believe it. Come and receive it. All the power of his spirit is now. The power of his spirit is now. Forever yours. Are we, are we actually reading, understanding what we're actually singing? The power is yours. The power is in your hand. We pray that with the children. Children, the power of God is in your hand. The mighty power of God is in your hand. In the palm of you have the power. You have the authority. But that same power 
that same authority that God has given the children is given to us as adults. Amen. There is no limitation with God. There is no limitation with God. Take the limits off church. Take the limits off that you have put on God. This morning we came. We have come to believe for it. Whatever you are believing for this morning, healing, restoration, forgiveness, whatever it is, in the name of Jesus, we're going to believe for it. 1 John 5, this is the word that God gave me from in January, as he's been giving it to me for a while. 1 John 5, it says, 14, this is the confidence. And the Lord challenged me, Ross, what kind of confidence do you have in my word? What kind of confidence do you have when, you, when it comes to believing for the impossible? But it says right here, it stirred me. It says, this is the confidence we have. This is a we thing here. We have this confidence in approaching God. That if you ask, if we ask anything according to his will, this is what God spoke to me. He says, Roz, I hear you. I hear you. When you come and approach me, I hear you. So whatever you ask, we know that we have that, what we have asked of him in Jesus' name. This one we're going to sing a song, it's called Believe For It. And we're going to really believe for it. Some of you have mountains that are so big, this one they're coming down. Some of you have doubts that are so big, but this morning your doubt is coming down. Some of you have unforgiveness so big inside of you is coming down today. Some of you have sickness in your body. You're going to be healed today. It's time for us to keep declaring what God has said. These mountains. Who says these mountains can't be moved? Who says that? Don't tell me God can't do it. We sang that last week. Don't tell me he can't do it. Because the God we serve, the God I serve, says I can do all things. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift your hands before heaven right now. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We're going to speak to our mountains this morning. The mountains are not going to take a hold of us. We're going to speak to our mountains this morning. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. can be moved they say these chains will never break thank you Jesus but they don't know you like we do there is power in your name we've heard that there is no way through They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much, so much power in your name. Yes, move the immovable, break the No. 
mantra, sing it out, declare it. You said, he said it. It is done. Let me hear you sing. You said, I believe. You said.
on the impossible. He said greater things, greater things that we're going to see. And that's not greater in number because there's more of us than Jesus, okay? And that's a pop up. That's what the, the church used for you. Oh, well, we, we're not going to see those miracles, you know, that Jesus did. You're walking on the water and seeing all that stuff happen. But we'll see greater miracles because there's more of us. No, that's not what he's saying. We are going to see greater. There is no reason why we cannot see blind eyes open. There's no reason why we cannot see the lame walk. There's no reason why we cannot see the blind ears on the Lord. There is no reason. He from the impossible have an expectation. What are you expecting? What are you believing? And, and get you, when the words that come out of your mouth, the words that come out of your mouth, get those words in line with the word of God. And hold on. Hold on. Expect. Expect to see it. Expect to receive it. Expect to believe that it's going to be done in Jesus' name. You said, I believe. Come on, church, just declare. You said it. It is done.
Jesus. Well, praise God. God is so good. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Why don't you all stand with me, Phil, please? I want you to put your hands together and thank God for the ministry gift He's given us in the person of Dupe. Come on up, Dupe. Amen. Well, we the word of God today. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. It's nice to still be able to say good morning. Um, thank you, Pastor David. Thank you, Roz, for giving me this opportunity. You know I like to sing, right? That's natural to me. <laughs> But for a long time, and Pastor David and Roz can, can attest to this, anytime I'm asked to share, I say no. Yep. <laughs> for a long, long time, until I said yes the first time. <laughs> and then I said yes the first time, and, and I allowed God to do what he wanted to do and say what he wanted to say. And since then, I've been learning to say yes. Father's Day to all the fathers in the house today. We celebrate you. We love you. We really appreciate all of you. And the ones that are joining us online too, happy Father's Day to you all. We thank God for the fathers in Israel. Just like their mothers in Israel, their fathers in Israel. So we thank God for the fathers in Israel. The fathers that choose to stand as fathers. That choose to do what God has called them to do. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are in your presence. We thank you that when we are in your presence, you honor us by speaking to us, by ministering to us, by meeting us at the point of our needs. I stand before you this morning as a vessel, O oh God. You have what you want to speak to your people. You have what you want to say to each heart and mind, both those that are listening online and those that are in the house this morning. And so I release myself into your hands as a vessel of God, that you will speak what you need to speak and that your people will hear what they need to hear and they will not just hear, oh God, that your people will receive the grace to be obedient and act on what they have heard, oh God so that you then can do what you have promised you will do. And we ask that you just take all the glory in this house this morning, that no flesh will glory in your presence, and that at the end of it all, O oh God, we, your people, will be blessed, and we will testify of your blessings in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, this part was not part of the sermon, by the way, just so you know. But God, you know, when I was writing down my sermon, mom was just asking me, she said, where's your notebook? I said, I don't have a notebook because, you know, I like to pull mom's legs. But I do have my notebook. And, and in this very notebook, the first uh, page in this notebook was Christmas in November 2019. That was the first time I said yes, by the way, just so you know. And now we're getting to the last page in this notebook. <laughs> Hopefully not the last time I will say yes. Father's Day 2023. So we are going to be talking about what I called a humble trust today. And our reading is going to be taken from the Psalms. Psalm 131. We're reading the whole song. Don't worry, it's just three verses. <laughs> trust in the Lord. That's what it is titled in my Bible here, which is the contemporary English version. It says, I am not conceited, Lord, and I don't waste my time on impossible schemes. But I have learned to feel safe and satisfied, just like a young child on its mother's lap. People of Israel, you must trust the Lord now and forever. But there is a verse that I love so much, and that is from uh, a version that I love so much, and that is from The Voice. And I'm going to read it to you. I wrote it out here to make it easy. O Eternal One, 
My heart is not occupied with proud thoughts. My eyes do not look down on others. I don't even begin to get involved in matters too big, matters of faith, state, business, or the many things that defy my ability to understand them. Of one thing I am certain, my soul has become calm, quiet, and contented in you. Like a winged child resting upon his mother, I am quiet. My soul is like this winged child. O oh, Israel, stake your trust completely in the eternal one from this very moment and into the vast future. Humble trust. Fathers, I know it's Father's Day, so the message is not just for you, the fathers, just so you all know. I'm not saying the rest of you should close your ears and only the fathers should be listening. No, this message is for all of us. Humble trust requires the posture of our hearts to be aligned with God. Now, it is possible for me, I'll give an example, to be angry with my mom. And she asked me to do something and I don't want to do it. But I go ahead and do it. But my heart is still very angry with her. So even though I am obeying, I am not obeying from a place of trust because I am angry with her. So my heart is actually kind of bitter and angry. When we say humble trust, it's the trust that the obedience is coming from a place where the posture of your heart is aligned with God himself. So you don't pat yourself on, your, on the back and say, oh, well, I exercised self-control because I didn't speak to that person. But you're actually very angry with that person and in your heart. In fact, you spoke more than a million words to that person. Okay? Remember what Jesus said. When you've conceived it in your heart, you've done it already. It doesn't matter whether you eventually do it or not. If you conceive it and you do it in your heart, you have done it. So we need to hold that posture where our hearts are aligned with what God is saying so that when we are actually obeying and acting on things that have been said to us or instructed to us by God himself, Everything is in alignment. That's what the purse, the, the, that's what humble trust requires. So David started the psalm. This is a psalm of David. I know it makes no sense, right? How does David, the shepherd boy who became king, say that he does not get himself involved in matters of the state, <laughs> in matters of business, in matters of the kingdom, it seems very like counterintuitive, counter right? This is the same David of Goliath thing, right? The same David of the bear and lion killing exploits. The same David says, I am not proud, I am not conceited. What is the thing that differentiates what David is saying from the very mighty acts he's doing? Being proud and being conceited is conceived in his heart. There's a reason God said, David is the man after my own heart. Because David usually had his heart right. So whatever he did aligned with what was in his heart. So it shows that David knew much more than anything that his heart had to always be the first place to walk on before he actually acted. He had to make those decisions in his heart ahead of time. So he made the decision, I will not sin against the Lord in his heart. It's similar to Joseph. 
Joseph made the decision not to sin in his heart a long time ago, long before Potiphar's wife came to him. He said, how could I do such an evil thing against the Lord? Because he had already made that decision in his heart. So his heart was already aligned with what God wanted. So how does David, a shepherd boy, now turned king, that set the standard by which all other kings after him were judged. You know, each time, if you, if you read through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, each time God referred to any of the kings, whether it be of Israel, after the kingdom was divided, of Judah, it would say either the king followed in the ways of David, or it would say it did not follow in the ways of David and then it would describe whichever evil way it chooses to follow. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the first one that set everything astray and most of the kings followed after him and then Ahab set his own precedence of the evil kings and then Manasseh took it way overboard. So, but each time God was going to refer to those kings or describe what those kings did, he always described them by saying he did not follow after David or in the case of Hezekiah or Josiah, the ones that actually followed, he will say they followed after the steps of David his ancestor. So how does this same David, a shepherd boy turned king, how do you reconcile him not being proud or conceited or getting involved in matters so big. Because we know he did, right? We know he did. He was king. It is because he chose to have humble trust in the Lord. And that humble trust is what it describes in verse 2 of the psalm. He said, I have learned to feel safe and satisfied. The voice which I read to you earlier says, of one thing I am certain. My soul has become calm and quiet and contented in you. The contemporary says, just like a young child on its mother's lap, the voice says, like a weaned child resting upon his mother, I am quiet. Now, when you win a child, usually, when, when you're in the process of the winning, there's always a bit of complaining and lack of trust because the child is used to one way of feeding and then it looks like you're taking that away from them. So they're afraid, they're like, why is mom doing this to me? And then you gradually do it, you gradually do it till they get used to the fact that, oh, she's not stopping to feed me. She's just feeding me new things. And then the child relaxes once they are weaned because they know I will still get fed. I will still be satisfied. So this is the picture David is painting for us. The picture of the kind of trust he has. He said he has become contented in God. His soul is calm and quiet. You know, when, you, when we tend to struggle, when we tend to worry, when we tend not to rest because we think we have so much to do, it's usually because at some point we've stopped resting, we've stopped being calm, we've allowed our soul not to be quiet and restored in God, and now we're taking so much more on ourselves than we're actually supposed to do. This is what David started with in the beginning of the verse. He said, I don't take upon myself what matters that are too high from me. So it tells me that even true rest requires humility. You need to come to that place where you have humbly released yourself to God and you're saying I don't need that much I don't need to to be that or all that you don't need to be because Jesus is all that already anyways so he, David had learned to feel safe in God's hands 
He did not need to exert himself mentally or physically when not needed. So then there was no need for him to get into a state of frustration or overly, overly being tired or just, you know, all those things that, that weigh down on you when you take more upon yourself than you're actually supposed to be. Now, listen to me. I am not making this an excuse for any or all of us to become lazy. Absolutely not. Okay? We're not saying don't do anything and be lazy. That's not what I'm preaching here. What I'm saying is that your decision making of when to do something or when not to do something, when to exert energy on something and when not to exert energy on something, aligns with God's heart. So that even when you are exerting energy, you know your strength will be renewed because you are doing what God says you should do, when God is saying you should do it, and how God is saying you should do it. Okay? That is what it is. So, what does this have to do with the fathers? You know, I have to, you know I have to talk specifically to the fathers today, right? It's for all of us, but I need to just focus a bit on the fathers right now. So bear with me, everybody. But don't close your ears, okay? Now, in this present times, there is this pull, either from the right or from the left, of what is expected of fathers, okay? We all know that. We agree, right? We have those that say, oh, they have to be macho, you know, work, 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 hustle, 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 do this, do that, and do that. We have those that say, oh, they should just sit and do absolutely nothing. <laughs> the truth is, neither is right. That's because right. all of those positions that the fathers are being pulled, pulled from, their positions of men that have tried to modify what God actually wants you to do. And of course, you know, when, when man takes something God has written, we normally mess it up yeah. if we're not walking with the yes, Holy Spirit. Right. Yes, right. And because those positions are coming from the world, you know they're not work, working with the Holy Spirit, right? Right. right? So it's not about being mature. It's not about working hard and harder and harder. It's not about hustling and hustling and hustling till your kingdom comes. While on the surface, all of this might look harmless. The point is, where are you doing all of these things from? What is the posture of your heart as you're trying to do all of this? Is your heart in full alignment with God? Are you hearing God telling you, okay, this is the project I need you to work on now. This is what I need you to speak over your family now. Or this is what I need you to do right now. Is that where this is coming from? I'm just going to give examples from the Bible of when you need to do something, what you need to do, and when you don't need to do anything. I'll start with Ezekiah. So Ezekiah has become king. The king of Assyria, Sennacherib, has come after Israel at this point. You know, and the thing is, Ezekiah was actually kind of nice to him at the beginning. He said, okay, I will give you this and this and this. And then he, he sent, you know, his emissaries from Assyria to say, I want all of this and tell all the people, I just want to take all of you out. When what God had spoken, even though God had spoken that they will go into captivity, it was not time and it was not Sarah Kilim's call to make. And Hezekiah, you know, he got that letter. That was the, by the way, that was the prayer I sent to you when, yes. when the, the whole thing about the roof started. Yes. He got that letter. Now, he could have said, I am going to fight over the 600,000 armies of Assyria. But no, because Ezekiah was a man that heard from God. Ezekiah was a man that aligned himself with the prophet Isaiah, who he knew heard from God. And he knew his place as king, not prophet. Something Saul obviously did not understand. That was his problem. We're going to come to Saul later. And Hezekiah took that letter into the temple and he prayed. And then he sent the scribe and the other people to Isaiah to say, this is the letter 
And then Isaiah, Isaiah came, right? And then Isaiah spoke and said, this is not a fight that is yours. Now, there are many victories in the Bible where God actually allowed Israel to go ahead and fight. They fought physically and they won. The, 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 man, the, the war against Goliath and the Philistines that David had was one of those. But there were times that God chose that it is not your battle to fight. And this was one of those times. But the only way a king could tell that difference was by hearing from God's spirit, either by himself or through the prophets that God had already put over his people to speak his heart unto his people. The difference between then and now is that each and every one of us can prophesy because we are all children of God. Each and every one of us can actually hear God speak to us because we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I leave. And because I live now, you will have the comforter. The Holy Spirit who is going to make all things clear to you. That's the difference between then and now. And God spoke through Isaiah to Hezekiah. He said, this is not a battle you're going to lift a finger. By the same way Sennacherib brought his army to besiege you, by that very same way he's going to go back to his country without lifting a finger against you. We were talking about this in our devotion yesterday. This was this is one of the battles I loved in the Bible because it didn't involve any fighting at all. God needed to send all of one angel, one, just one, into the camp of the enemy. And he wiped out hundreds of thousands of the army. And God, you know the way God works is it's just amazing. God didn't kill Sennacherib himself. He allowed Sennacherib to wake up the next morning and see that all his armies were gone. They were dead, dead, all gone. And you know what happened? He packed his things and as the word said, exactly as the word said through the prophet Isaiah, he packed his thing, he turned around and went back to his country. And every other thing God said was going to happen to him, including how he was going to die, it happened. Not one word fell to the ground. That was because you had a king who chose to align the posture of his heart to be able to trust God, to bend down, come to the temple, lay something before God at the altar. The thing about laying before, laying before the altar is that it, it allows you to try to get into a posture of humility because you're saying, Lord, I cannot do this, so I am giving it to you. Now, what do you want me to do? What part can I do? Okay? Now, there we have Saul on the other side of the spectrum. This was a man of humble beginnings. He was chosen from the smallest family in the youngest tribe of Israel. But God chose him. God looked on him and chose him to be king over his people. You would say that is a great opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you know, when God was going to do this, God was speaking to him through Samuel, who was the prophet and the priest and who had his part to play. Right? Yeah. Now, when you start, God ascends you to the throne this is the person through whom he spoke to you, he instructed you. Would you not think it wise to always wait for that person, you know, to continue to instruct and lead you and guide you as he had guided you to the throne? No. In first, the first time, first instruction he was given, Saul decided to overstep his bounds and take matters into his own hands. The voice actually described this this way. Saul took matters too big <laughs> into his own hands. It was a very simple instruction. The king was not supposed to offer that sacrifice before the battle. Yeah. That was not the place of Saul. 
that was the place of Samuel. And Samuel gave a specific instruction. Wait for me. Wait for me. Very simple. But what happened? There was no humble trust for Saul. He was more worried about the army. He was more worried about the people. They were going to leave him. And then he was going to be a king without anybody to fight a battle. Like as if it was even too much for God to fight the battle all by himself with one angel if he chose to anyways, even if the people left. It didn't matter. You know, some of us, we read those places in the Bible and we're thinking, why did God have to take that so personal? Especially because Samuel was a little bit late, right? Well, it didn't matter. What mattered was the posture of Saul's heart in all of this. He overstepped his bound, did what Samuel was supposed to do, not what he was supposed to do. He was deciding by himself and listening to him. You know, some people like to listen to themselves a lot. <laughs> they like to speak to themselves. You know, I like to listen to myself, but only when I'm speaking the right things. Yeah. When I'm not speaking the right, I'm, I'm not joking here. When I'm not speaking the right thing, I don't like to listen to myself. Because that means I'm listening to something that is going into my heart that should not be going yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like to listen to myself when I'm speaking the right thing. But here was Saul, not speaking the right thing or doing the right thing, yet he chose to listen to his own counsel and do things all by himself. He did it the first time. And it was at that very instance the kingdom was actually taken away from him. It wasn't even later. It was at that very instance, that first instance of the, although he had many more instances of disobedience, <laughs> it wasn't just that one. Yeah, right. it, it, the man just kept on going downhill instead of trying to climb yeah. uphill. He kept on going down here. And at that point, God said in the book of 1 Samuel, I believe it was chapter 13, when he said obedience is better than sacrifice. I don't, I can't remember the exact verse. I have it down here somewhere. Did I miss it? Oh, verse 14. Ah, it was verse 14. Okay, there. And I have my marker there. I just didn't see it. He said, this is what Samuel said to him, by, by the way. I like Samuel. He tells it that it is. I'm going to start from verse 12 because I like the way Samuel said it here. He said, oh, so this was, this, this was Saul telling, you know, trying to make an excuse for why he decided to do what Samuel was supposed to do. He said, oh, and I was worried that they would attack me here in Gil Gilgal and I had not offered the sacrifice to ask for the Lord's help. So I forced myself. Are you listening to this man? I forced myself to... When you're forcing yourself to do something that you're not supposed to do, uh -huh. you, you know you have it all wrong already. Uh -huh. yeah. He says, I forced myself to offer a sacrifice on the altar fire. Well, guess what Samuel said? Verse 13. I like the way this Bible puts it. <laughs> that was stupid. <laughs> That's what my Bible says. I'm reading it as it is. That was stupid, Samuel said. You didn't obey the Lord your God. If you had obeyed him, someone from your family would always have been king of Israel. But no, you disobeyed. And so the Lord won't choose anyone else from your family to be king. In fact, listen to this. He has already chosen the one who he wants to be the next leader of his people. God has found a man who seeks his will. So long before David even came into the picture, at this point David had no idea. But you know what? God saw David's heart. While he was the shepherd boy, Watching the sheep, the last born of the family that nobody cared about, even when they wanted to come and anoint the king, he always had his heart aligned with God. And that was what God saw. And that was the difference between him and Saul. So fathers, don't be blown away by what the world is saying you need to be or you don't need to be. The only thing you need to be worried about is what God says you need to be. Is who God says 
you need to be. And it's what God says you need to do when he says you need to do it and how he says you need to do it. When you have all those things aligned, then you don't have to worry. Even when it is stressful and you need to work, then it will release the strength and the grace you need because it is what he has asked you to do. Even and when you need to choose to rest and not worry about it, like David said, the picture of that child that is weaned and contented in the mother's arms because the child knows I am going to be fed is not just the way I was being fed before. You are content in God because you know, well, that means this is not a battle I need to fight. There's no need to exert energy. There's no need to do this. And so our obedience usually will stem from the fact that we humbly trust the Lord. Now, when we do not humbly trust the Lord, we will have a problem with obedience. That was Saul's problem. He couldn't trust. He couldn't wait. So he, had, so he led to disobedience. Yeah. And in fact, he even got the people into trouble as king <laughs> too. One of the other things he did was out of nowhere for no reason. Now God has asked you to go and still fight the battle. You're fighting against the Philistines. You're winning. And then you decide you make an oath or a curse. You place a curse and you say, nobody must eat anything till evening. You're fighting a battle that God is asking you to fight at this point. Hmm. Then you tell your armies, nobody must eat anything till the evening. Of course, they're going to become physically weak. Hmm. It wasn't what God asked you to do. And then you did that. So when the evening comes, everybody just takes everything they find and they start eating with blood and whatnot. Sure. Again, the Sobain now puts in the armies in a place where they are disobedient to what God had said. And that's why this is key for the fathers. You lead in the homes. You lead outside the homes, whether you're a father figure or a leading figure anywhere. When you make that one step wrong, for that decision, you are placing a host of people in jeopardy, usually, starting with your family. It is important that you don't just drag everybody downhill with you. That was what Saul did. He dragged the whole country downhill with him. And this is what the devil wants. You know, once you can get the head and the people leading in the, ho in the homes to go downhill, to misalign themselves from God. You know, it's so funny. I I I'm a very technical person. And one of the books I was reading recently, it's not technical, it's just one of them. Um, my uh, books that I choose to read for growth and development in general. He said if, if a plane is starting from Los Angeles and you tilt the nose of the plane by just about one degree, you won't notice the difference while it's on the runway because it's just one degree. Now, 90 degrees will be like this, right? So one degree will be, you can't even see that I moved my finger right now, but I did. So that's like one degree would be. Now, if that plane takes off from Los Angeles and it's supposed to go to New York JFK, but just as you've tilted it by that one degree angle, if it continues following that path, it's going to end up in Delaware. <laughs> I'm not joking here. This is, this, is, this, is, this is just math and angle. Yes, application of math and angles here. If it takes off, instead of landing in GFK in New York, it will land in Delaware. One degree. So you might be like, oh, but it was just that one little thing I, I didn't do. Guess what? That one little thing that God asked you to 